Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Uh, I have no announcements to make at the top of this briefing, so we can get right to your questions. Nedra. Great. Thanks, Jay. Um, uh, what can you tell us about reports out of Geneva that um, the U.S. is prepared to offer some relief from sanctions if Iran um, takes steps to limit its ability to make a nuclear weapon? Uh, thank you for that, and uh, bear with me because I have uh, a fairly uh, lengthy comment to make in response. The P5 plus one is engaged in serious and substantive negotiations with Iran that offer the possibility of a verifiable diplomatic agreement that will prevent, prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Those talks are continuing today in Geneva, where the United States is represented by Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Wendy Sherman. We are not going to comment on the specifics of our negotiating positions. In general, the P5 plus one is focused on developing a phased approach that in the first steps halts Iran's nuclear program from moving forward and potentially rolls back parts of it. The first step would address Iran's most advanced nuclear activities, increase transparency so Iran will not be able to use the cover of talks to advance its program, and create time and space as we negotiate a comprehensive agreement. This would stop Iran's nuclear program from advancing for the first time in a decade. In exchange for concrete, verifiable measures to address the P5 plus 1's concerns during the first step, the P5 plus 1 would consider limited, targeted, and reversible relief that does not affect our core sanctions architecture. That core sanctions architecture would be maintained until there is a final, comprehensive, verifiable agreement that resolves the international community's concerns. If Iran does not live up to its commitments, the temporary modest relief would be terminated, and we would be in a position to ratchet up the pressure even further by adding new sanctions. And finally, any agreement between the international community and Iran will have to prove to the international community that Iran's program will be used for exclusively peaceful purposes in a meaningful and verifiable way. Iran must also meet its international obligations and fulfill its responsibilities under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, its responsibilities to the IAEA, uh, and its responsibilities to stay in compliance with UN uh, Security Council resolutions. The P5 plus one remains united in this approach. Um, how close are you to a deal? There were some reports from the Iranians that it could happen today. Uh, I have no updates on uh, the negotiations. They're serious and substantive. Uh, and they are ongoing. Uh, but again, uh, they, uh, what is being discussed is a phased approach that would have a first step. But I have no announcements to make about uh, the details of those negotiations or uh, where they are uh, in, in, in the progress they're making. Would Steve. You describe this as progress, Jay, when the Iranians are saying it so. There's no question, Steve, that uh, over the course of the last weeks and days, there has been progress. You saw that uh, in the aftermath of the elections in Iran. And we've seen it in a new openness from Iranian leaders uh, to the demands of the international community that they meet their responsibilities when it comes to their nuclear weapons program. The uh, approach the United States has taken with our allies has brought us to this point. There is no question that the very uh, extensive sanctions regime that has been put in place, the sanctions architecture that has been put in place uh, led by the United States has had a dramatic impact on the Iranian economy. And Iranians, uh, er, the Iranian leadership is very interested in uh, getting out from under those uh, sanctions and uh, trying to reverse some of the negative consequences to their economy. We have always said that we're interested in making sure Iran does not and cannot acquire a nuclear weapon through diplomatic means. One, because a diplomatic resolution to this challenge is obviously preferable. Uh, and it's preferable in part because it would be the most certain and verifiable way to uh, make sure that Iran never uh, acquires a nuclear weapon. But there is a limited window of opportunity here. So we're taking advantage of uh, 
a new level of seriousness that we've seen to engage in negotiations, but we are doing it uh, in a way that makes clear uh, that uh, actions are what matter here, uh, that steps that the P5 plus 1 would uh, insist upon in return for the uh, moderate relief that I described would have to be verifiable, and they would be reversible. And if uh, a comprehensive agreement were not reached, that relief would be terminated and there would be the opportunity to ratchet up sanctions further. Some members of the Senate have been wanting to add sanctions. Have you briefed them on this proposal? Uh, have you persuaded them to hold off on what they've been wanting to do? Well, we uh, have worked very closely with Congress and Congress has been an excellent partner in general in the approach that the administration has taken uh, towards uh, this challenge. And the sanctions architecture that's in place is a multilateral, but it's also unilateral, and, and uh, Congress has been a, an effective partner in helping put that architecture in place. Our, our view has been that we need to allow uh, for a pause here so that we can explore the potential represented by these uh, serious and substantive negotiations. And as I said uh, earlier, if we were not able to reach, if the P5 plus 1 were not able to reach a final agreement, a comprehensive agreement, uh, then there would be the uh, potential not only to terminate the relief that we uh, put in place, but to ratchet up sanctions further. And, and none of the relief that we're talking about here as part of a first step in this phased approach, phased in approach would, uh, would be irreversible. It would all be reversible so that we could, if necessary, uh, terminate that relief and then potentially ratchet up, say, uh, ratchet up sanctions further, uh, obviously we would continue to consult with Congress in that effort uh, as we have throughout. General Jay, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, the President's comments last night in Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, he said uh, we anticipate, use the word anticipate, that by November 30th uh, that the website will be able to work as it was supposed to. Uh, it, it just sounds like there's a little bit of wiggle room there in, in using the word anticipate. Uh, can you say what the consequences would be for CMS, HHS, people inside this White House if that website is not working the way it's supposed to by November 30th? Well, I, I can tell you that the uh, objective here has not changed. Our position has not changed. It is still that uh, the website and its problems are being addressed by a team of experts and uh, that that work is continuing uh, round the clock every day and that by the end of the month, uh, we expect the site to be functioning uh, at the standards necessary for the vast majority of the American people, and that's what we've said from the beginning. So I, I wouldn't uh, read anything into that, except to say that this is obviously challenging work because the problems uh, are many, and we've acknowledged that, and uh, the President's made clear that that circumstance is unacceptable to him, which is why he's you know, demanded that all the action be taken that's being taken. So uh, the work continues, and again, we expect the website to be functioning uh, effectively for the vast majority of users by the end of the month. And uh, what is the plan B if that doesn't happen? If the website's not working, are there deliberations underway right now inside the administration to perhaps extend the enrollment deadlines to uh, all of the various things that you've been asked about mm -hmm. at these sure. briefings. Uh, is there a plan B? Jim, I would say that right now the, the tech experts who can answer this question better than uh, anyone else in terms of uh, what fixes need to be made and on what schedule they can be made uh, believe that this can be done by the end of the month so that the website is functioning effectively for the vast majority of users. That has never meant that there would be uh, zero problems with the site, as is the case with almost any complicated and complex site, uh, both private and, and public, that exists. But it has to be functioning effectively for the vast majority of users. Uh, it's an important portal through which uh, the American people who are interested in applying for coverage, or at least finding out their options, uh, you know, that you know, it's an important portal for them to use. Now there are, as we know and we've discussed, other ways for them to get the information and they can um, window shop already 
uh, on the website. Uh, but we're at work trying to make it uh, better every day, and it is getting better every day. Uh, but we're not there yet. I think Secretary Sebelius made clear yesterday that we're not there yet. Uh, and I know anecdotally you see uh, proof of that, that the site is not uh, firing effectively on all pistons, if you will, uh, yet, but it, it needs to be, and that's why that work is so important. You know, and when it comes to the question of extending, we, as I pointed out yesterday, and, and I think Secretary Sebelius did too, we are still uh, fairly early in a six-month open enrollment period. And it is our belief that if the site is working effectively as expected, uh, that there is time to make sure that the people who are interested in enrolling in these uh, options for coverage through the marketplaces will be able to do so in time to get insurance on January 1st. And, and obviously, the enrollment period itself lasts uh, through the end of March. Because if you don't get it done by November 30th, obviously, there becomes a very short window of opportunity for people to sign up for insurance so they have coverage starting January 1st. So, I mean, that's... Well, your understanding of the calendar is mine as well, but I, I, I'm saying that it, it, is, it is our position that uh, the work is being done and that it will... Is. No, but it, it will, that it will be completed, uh, which is not to take away from uh, the, the challenges that it represents, but uh, we believe we have uh, the teams in place necessary to do the work mm -hmm. and uh, that that work will continue to progress and make improvements to the site. Uh, there are, I think, anybody... Uh, who monitors this closely can say that the improvements that uh, have been achieved are noticeable, uh, but we're not there yet. And, and just very quickly, um, the uh, the chairman of the Ways and Means <coughs> Committee over in the House, Dave Camp, has issued a subpoena uh, for enrollment numbers by close of business tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Is the president or is, is this White House instructing CMS, HHS to deliver those numbers? I, I don't have uh, anything on the subpoena. I would tell you that we're cooperating with uh, oversight We've addressed the issue of enrollment numbers. If, if the purpose is to point out, which I'm sure it is, that enrollment numbers uh, will be low for October, uh, take it from me, they'll be low in October. Uh, we've acknowledged that. They were always going to be low, and that was even when uh, we did not expect the problems with the website that occurred. So what, what is our responsibility is, make sure, is to make sure that the data uh, is assessed and made accurate before it's released publicly, because there are so many uh, inputs here when it comes to the collection of data. So that process will uh, take place. I believe Marilyn Tavener uh, remarked uh, in, here, in a hearing earlier this week that, uh, as we've said before, that that data will be available in uh, the middle of November, which is consistent with the way <coughs> these kinds of, this kinds of data is released for other programs. So. Uh, that remains our plan. So she says by mid-November, you're saying by mid-November, that, that potentially could mean that you may not comply with the subpoena. And I, 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 I'm, I'm not the counsel, uh, so I don't, I, haven't, I don't have a response to the subpoena. I can tell you that, uh, or to the reports of the subpoena, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen it myself. But the, uh, we're working on a schedule. For, I mean, let, let's, let's just focus, again, on, on the purpose of, a, uh, of an exercise like that, which is clearly to make political hay out of what we've already acknowledged. The website's not working well, hasn't been working well for the first uh, month of the rollout. It's improving daily, but it is not where it needs to be. Uh, in large measure, because of the uh, problems with the website, the enrollment figures will be even lower than the low numbers that were anticipated because of the nature of these kinds of programs and the way that people uh, tend to enroll when you have a, a, a deadline. Uh, six months uh, later. So uh, we saw this in Massachusetts, as the President pointed out last week in Boston, that uh, in the very similar Massachusetts program in the first month of that enrollment period, uh, for that program only 123 premium paying customers enrolled. Uh, and of course, uh, that represented 0.3 percent of the number who eventually enrolled. Uh, so I think that's the model to look at and then add to that the fact that we've had the troubles we've had. John. Uh, Jay, back on Iran, mm -hmm. uh, Senator Corker uh, has put forth a measure that would bar the administration from using its power to waive some of the sanctions uh, during this interim period uh, that you spoke about, unless mm -hmm. Iran agrees to stop all enrichment mm -hmm. uh, activities and uh, comply with all UN resolutions uh, on mm -hmm. this. Does the administration oppose such a measure? Uh, I don't have a specific response to the legislation that you referenced, but I would say that no one is suggesting an open-ended open delay uh, to sanctions. Uh, 
uh, for new sanctions, and there may come a point where additional sanctions are necessary. At the same time, it is important for Congress to reserve its ability to legislate for the moment when it's most effective in, or in order to give our current, uh, to give the current P5 plus 1 negotiations uh, the best chance to make real progress in achieving our shared goal of preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. I would simply say that we are at this point uh, in large part because of the approach that the administration has taken over the past five years uh, in building an international consensus behind uh, the premise that Iran has been the problem when it comes to Iran's refusal to adhere to its international obligations. Uh, that consensus has allowed us to put in place the most comprehensive uh, sanctions regime in history, which has had significant impact on the Iranian economy. And, and that has come with a great deal of cooperation uh, with Congress. And we fully expect to continue that consultation and cooperation with Congress. Our uh, view at this point is that these negotiations represent an opportunity to, sh to achieve the goal that we, uh, I think, share with Congress and obviously with our allies uh, and so many others in the international community, uh, which is to ensure that Iran cannot obtain and will not obtain a nuclear weapon. Uh, we need to pursue that diplomatic opening because it exists, and we need to uh, take the steps necessary to uh, test the, the theory that uh, the new Iranian leadership and the old Iranian leadership is actually uh, interested in abiding by its international obligations and doing so in a way that is verifiable and meaningful and transparent. Well, if, that, if that does not come to pass, uh, we will absolutely uh, retain the right uh, and believe it would be important to terminate any moderate sanctions relief that might take place and to even ratchet up sanctions if necessary. Well, let me ask you about uh, Bob Menendez, of course, the Democratic mm -hmm. Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. He says he doesn't understand why uh, during this interim period for negotiations Iran couldn't be asked simply to suspend all enrichment activities, not roll it back, not limit the number of centrifuges, but simply suspend it. And uh, what, what Menendez is saying is that's what should happen before there should be any even limited rolling back. Does the White House disagree with Senator Menendez on this? Well, I would say that we're not getting into uh, specifics about the negotiations taking place in Geneva, as I noted at the top. Uh, I would say that the first step of this phase in approach that we're talking about here uh, would have uh, the effect of halting the Iranian nuclear weapons program halting it, which means basically... All, all enrichment? I mean, the, the weapons program, they deny they even have. It would, so it, 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 would, all it would stop Iran's nuclear program from advancing for the first time in a decade. From advancing, so that doesn't mean it stops the program, does it? I mean, it it stops it from advancing. So basically, well, when you talk about, when we make... Centrifuges are still spinning, well, they're still enriching? I, I would refer you to IAEA and others on, on the, the uh, technical means by which the halt is achieved, but I would tell you that when when our intelligence community and other intelligence communities make assessments about how long, uh, it, you know, where they are in their program and how long it would take for them to develop a nuclear weapon uh, and where they are in the process of enrichment, uh, that all that progress would halt. And that essentially, by halting the clock and potentially rolling back uh, where they are, puts time on the clock to allow for uh, the pursuit of a more comprehensive agreement. If that can't be achieved, the moderate sanctions relief we're talking about here uh, would be reversible and you know we would be in a situation where acting with the international community acting with uh, congress we could uh, reins uh, reinstate all of the sanctions and uh, consider ratcheting up sanctions to ra to increase pressure because again it's the approach that we've taken with regards to sanctions and the international consensus that we've built that has gotten us to this point uh, already. And can you re remind me of what the end goal here is? Because it, it had, you know, long been to stop all enrichment. Is that still no, our uh, stated where we policy go? has always been that we will prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. What's our the United on States policy is to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Our uh, our view is, as the president has said, with respect to the right of the Iranian people. Uh, to access a nuclear program, that we re actually we respect that right. But what the specific uh, of a peaceful nuclear program, what the specific nature of that program would be, uh, is a matter for 
discussion and negotiation. So we respect the right of Iran to have a peaceful nuclear program. Uh, we, our, our policy objective, which we share with our allies uh, and, uh, and everyone involved, obviously, in the P5 plus 1 and beyond, uh, is to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And I'm sorry, just one mm -hmm. quick on health care. Um, sure. Because I, I know you were asked about this, but I didn't hear you get asked this specifically. On Monday, the President said um, that uh, if you have had one of these plans before the Affordable Care Act came into law and you really like that plan, what we have said is that you could keep it if it hasn't changed since the law has mm -hmm. passed. I'm wondering, can you give me a citation of when the President ever said such a thing? Sure. We went through this the other day. The, um, the President was referring to the law, and I can obviously point you to the law, and people who covered the law, who wrote the law. But, but what he said is what we have said. I'm asking when did he actually say that? I mean, we heard him talk well, about I understand, John, and I, and I answered this uh, I the other day. I don't think he gave a citation of when he said this. So I'm just well, I, I, I understand the point you're trying to make, John, and what I said is that he was referring to the law uh, and to uh, the publishing of the rule, which was covered, again, by news organizations uh, about the grandfathering clause, uh, where uh, Kathleen Sebelius and others were quoted. The fact of the matter is, as you know, the uh, vast majority of the American people uh, already uh, receive health insurance coverage through their employer or through Medicare or Medicaid or uh, through the Veterans Administration. Fifteen percent of the country is uninsured and uh, because of the expansion of Medicaid or the uh, marketplaces uh, have available to them quality affordable health insurance for the first time. 5% uh, of the country gets its insurance on the individual market. The law is written so that those who had plans when the law was passed uh, could have those plans grandfathered in. And the, the point, obviously, which is, and I understand that there is a lot of uh, discussion about this, and, and, but, the, but if you had that plan before the law was passed, it could be grandfathered in. What is absolutely the case is in the market itself, in that section of the insurance market, uh, the individual insurance market, there is a tremendous amount of churn and always has been. Uh, people come in and out of that market. Their policies are routinely uh, changed or adjusted, often downgraded. And, and in this case, if you had a plan that was downgraded uh, it, and therefore a, a plan that already did not meet ACA standards that might have been grandfathered in was made uh, even less compliant with minimum standards then it would not be grandfathered in. Uh, but, uh, you know, our focus <coughs> is on making sure that millions of Americans who have not had access to affordable quality health insurance are able to uh, get access to it. That's the purpose of the Affordable Care Act. And we're going to continue to make sure that uh, by making improvements to the website, uh, by, you know, engaging in the kind of outreach the President engaged in yesterday, but so many others are engaged in to uh, get to Americans across the country the information they need to find out what their options are, uh, that, that we uh, steadily implement the law here and make sure that the marketplaces are stood up so that uh, the benefits of the Affordable Care Act are, are enjoyed by as many people as possible. Major. I'll get back to Ron in a minute, but since you had such a lengthy statement about something uh, recently published, I want to give you a chance on another foreign policy topic. Mm -hmm. There's a report that the administration is in talks with the Yemeni government about a detention facility there that would house some of the detainees currently in Guantanamo, specifically those uh, from Afghanistan and other countries. Can you say if these talks are in fact going on, and is this a potential partial resolution to the President's long sought goal of closing Guantanamo? Well, we continue to work on transfers, and uh, it is and remains the President's goal to close uh, the Gitmo facility. It, that's a goal shared by uh, many, both Democrats and Republicans, including military leaders, uh, because it's in the interest of our national security uh, in the United States. I don't have anything specific on conversations or negotiations with the Yemeni government. I, I think if you look back, there uh, was a judgment made about transfers of Yemeni prisoners, uh, or detainees, rather. Uh, that I, to which I'm sure this applies, but I don't have a specific this, this response to the. It would be more than transfers. It would be a facility. It would be a place. I'm, I, I just don't have anything on that for you, Major. Does it sound incorrect to you? Well, uh, uh, I'll have to take the question. Thank you very much. Uh, you can understand John's question about enrichment and mm -hmm. this standard of halting future progress because these 
Israeli government is very concerned about where Iran is currently, and that it may be within just a few technological steps of a nuclear weapon. So if, if, if you could provide any other clarity, Jay, about what the benefit of this halting standard is in comparison to where Iran is and where Israel feels it very quickly could be. Well, let's be clear that the United States and Israel absolutely share the same goal, which is to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And uh, we work very closely with the Israelis on this issue, and we share a lot of information about it. It remains our assessment that Iran would need at least one year to acquire one nuclear weapon from the time that Iran decides to pursue one, so the, the breakout move that is often discussed. And we would uh, be aware of that breakout move. What, if there were an agreement to take this first step as part of a phased approach, the halting of progress on this program would mean that that year would, instead of being from this day forward, would be from the day forward, forward that the agreement ended, if it were to end or not be uh, fulfilled in the final agreement. In other words, it, we would be essentially buying time. And that would be one of the values of it. One of the values to allow for uh, further negotiations to see if a comprehensive, verifiable, meaningful, transparent, and enforceable agreement could be achieved, working with the P5 plus 1 through the P5 plus 1. Uh, and, you know, we are, what we're talking about here would be uh, an agreement that would uh, assure the international community that its concerns are being met and that Iran's obligations to the IAEA, to the United Nations Security Council, and under the NPT are being met in a verifiable, enforceable way. By definition, in this first phase, should it be negotiated, the IAEA would be the organization that would provide that verification proof. Uh, they certainly have served that role in the past. I, uh, you know, in terms of the process by which a first step would be implemented, I would uh, refer you to the uh, P5 plus one, but also to uh, ask you to uh, to let's wait and see if if an agreement is reached because uh, you know we will have to you know we're still in, engaged in negotiations, um, but I want to be clear that um, the when we talk about the first step and the actions that the P5 plus one would take in exchange for concrete verifiable measures to address the P5 plus one's concerns. The P5 plus 1 would consider limited, targeted, and reversible relief that doesn't affect, and this goes to the question earlier, that does not affect our core sanctions architecture. We helped build that architecture. We were, in a way, the lead architect and the United States, and we believe strongly that the approach we've taken that has led to the building of that architecture and the impl imposition of these uh, very serious sets, uh, set of sanctions has served its goal well in forcing Iran to consider meeting its obligations under the international community because the cost of not doing so has been so high. Uh, but as I've said in the past, we, we, ent we engage in these negotiations uh, with our eyes wide open and we are focused on actions and not words. And uh, we would uh, take that approach through to the end. I know you don't want to get into details. <coughs> We can't, but one of the key points in a negotiation like this, if you get beyond sort of atmospherics and get down to specific asks, mm -hmm. meaning uh, and, and we reached a stage in these talks where it's not just general, but there are specific asks from the Iranians and specific asks from the P5 plus one on compliance, halting, and sanctions relief. Really. Can you at least say anything about that? Whether we're at the stage of yes, well, I can tell you broadly that serious and substantive negotiations uh, you know, contain within them discussions about how, how how you know what would be required to get to that first step, and 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 I've laid out for you here what that would look like from our point of view if if such a step were to be taken and agreed to, uh, and also what it would not be when it comes to uh, no agreement from the P5 plus 1 to compromise the 
san uh, the sanctions architecture, uh, that any step we would take in, in response to Iran's commitment to, in a verifiable way, halt its uh, nuclear program and can you define uh, would be, would be what, what, you, what the administration defines. I Is think the, the, the kinds of actions, well, the, the kind, you, well uh, actually the kinds of actions that uh, I'm speaking broadly, not specifically to what may be agreed to, but the kinds of actions that might be taken, uh, the temporary modest relief would be uh, of the nature that uh, would be easily reversible. So, uh, you know, might be more financial rather than uh, technical. But the, the point being that the kinds of things that we would look at doing would be the kinds of things that we could uh, turn on and off pretty quickly. Ed. A couple quick ones on health care. <clears throat> Recently in the Federal Register, the Health and Human Services Department suggested that they may be giving an exemption to some unions but also some businesses in terms of some fees that they would have normally paid to help fund the health care law in 2015 and 2016, as I, as I understand it. Question, do you know anything about that? It's been reported by Kaiser Health News and others that that's the interpretation of what they put in the Federal Register. And, uh, you know, is this um, a special treatment for unions who have supported the President, but more broadly, how are you going to fund the law if you continue to issue exemptions for some people? Ed, I, I, I don't uh, have anything on that. I, I haven't seen that article. Uh, from this podium a couple times you've suggested that the reason why people are getting cancellation letters is because insurance companies are stripping away benefits from existing plans, you said, uh, and uh, that took away the grandfathering opportunity. We've talked to uh, America's health insurance plans and they insist that the reason why people are really getting um, cancellation letters is that number one, people are not in these plans for very long, as you know, they often are in these uh, plans because they're in between jobs, et cetera. Uh, and so they joined these plans after 2010, so that's why they're not grandfathered. And also some of these folks have changed some of the plans. Um, so who's telling the truth? Well, I think what you just said, it remains true as well, that there, there are some people who had plans uh, were uh, covered within the individual market prior to 2010, and those uh, plans have been changed or downgraded, which Again, if you even if you just take the Affordable Care Act out of it, is something that happened frequently within the insurance market, uh, as I think m uh, many of us have even experienced over the years with uh, changes to the plan, changes to benefits and coverage, changes to costs. Uh, and in this case, if those plans were downgraded, uh, yeah. So, in other words, if even if the plan originally, when the law passed, did not meet the minimum standards uh, of coverage, uh, it would have been grandfathered in. But if it were changed in a way that significantly reduced the benefits even b below that, then obviously it would not be grandfathered in. It would not meet the minimum standards. But, but as I was saying earlier, it is definitely the case that because this, this section, this 5 percent of the insurance market is, uh, has traditionally been a place of a lot of churn, that there are people who have come into that market uh, in the interim. And so uh, it is the case that the grandfather clause did not apply to plans that did not yet exist or contracts that did not yet exist between uh, individuals and, and insurance companies. And look, I, I think it's, it's important here for me to say, you know, the administration, the president, the secretary, we're concerned about these individuals and we want to make sure, first and foremost, that they're getting all the information they need to know what options are available to them. And I think we've seen a lot of uh, evidence, and this is not about uh, you know, anybody purposely withholding information, but just a lot of evidence that they don't always know what uh, the marketplaces offer them and whether or not they uh, are eligible to, to receive subsidies. And it's on us to make sure that these individuals in that, uh, in that market who are getting these notices find out about their options. It's, you know, I think Consumer Reports reported earlier this week that in many cases the individuals who are getting these notices are only being told uh, that their current policy uh, ends at the end of the year and being told that they have options from the insurer that they uh, currently have and they may not be uh, fully informed about the fact that there are other options from other uh, competitive insurance companies or that uh, they may qualify for subsidies. So, and in some states, in fact up to a million people, I believe, of this uh, select uh, section of the population uh, would be eligible for coverage under Medicaid because of the expanded Medicaid program that a number of states have taken up. But so how do you react to the Washington Post this morning saying that you get three Pinocchios for suggesting this is the insurance industry to blame? Uh, well, well, I would say a couple of things. One, I think uh, I did not 
examine all of the math, but I, I'm not sure uh, that everyone would agree with the math specifically. But you, you would get no argument from us that there's a lot of churn that, that pre-existed the ACA in this market. This, this section of the insurance market has always been the most volatile. It's where people come in and out. It's where people's plans change and uh, where they're often purchasing insurance that uh, is uh, the least kind of uh, comprehensive because uh, they're in small risk pools uh, often and not in, uh, they don't have the kind of purchasing power to drive down prices that people who participate in large insurance pools participate in. That's the reason that we uh, created the marketplaces to begin with so that those with pre-existing conditions, for example, uh, were entered into a bigger pool uh, which would help keep costs down for insurers and for the insured. Uh, so I, I, I don't take an issue with that and I'm not, I, I, there is no, I'm not, we're, we're not blaming anyone uh, solely for this phenomenon. What is the fact, what is the case is that some of these uh, insurance plans that were out there as we've seen in some of the reports were pretty crummy. You know, there's the, the woman, you know, as we, I cited earlier, the woman from Florida who's who got a fair amount of attention, who, whose plan uh, turned out not to cover hospitalization and, uh, and others, you know, this is, that's, it's kind of, it, it's not uncommon in that market for, for insurance plans to be uh, less than comprehensive and to contain annual caps or lifetime caps or carve outs where coverage for specific conditions is not provided. So. Uh, there's no question that, again, pre-existing the Affordable Care Act, that that, that market was volatile and that uh, those individuals in it were uh, the least able to, or were the most vulnerable to uh, decisions by insurers to, to change their plans. Right, but you said you, nobody's blaming anybody, but November 5th, you said, quote, insurance companies that chose to strip away benefits from existing plans in the interim, mm -hmm. they canceled ex existing plans in the interim, they took away that grandfathering opportunity, and that's a reality. Well, like for them. well for that, um, what I'm saying is that's not that doesn't that's not everybody who's gotten a cancellation notice because, as you note and others have noted, obviously some people have bought into the individual market uh, in the interim between passage of the Affordable Care Act and the launch of the marketplaces. But for there certainly is a universe of people who have had their plans changed or downgraded, and and. You know, the fact is a, a, a plan that doesn't meet the standards that was introduced last year doesn't get grandfathered in because it didn't exist before 2010. My point is simply that we, even though, and we make this point, it, this is a slice of a small percentage of the population, these are very important people in the health insurance universe. The marketplaces are designed in part to provide them security and certainty, uh, the kind of security and certainty that, that they haven't necessarily had because of the nature of that market. And, uh, you know, we're, we're you know, going to continue to work hard to make sure that everybody in that market, as well as in the broader uh, universe of people who are looking at the options on the marketplaces, are getting all the information they need so that they know what their options are and they know if they're eligible for tax credits and they know uh, whether or not, as more than half of them, as will be the case for more than half of them, they're, they're actually going to get better coverage for the same or lower cost. Kristen. Jay, Humana has come out and said that they have slashed the amount of enrollees that they're inspect sure expecting in half uh, from 500,000 to 250,000. Doesn't that suggest or raise real concerns that you might not get the numbers that you need to get to make I haven't seen that story. I don't know. Is that what time period that is? The the fact is, as we've said, enrollment for October will be lower than expected, probably significantly lower because of the uh, problems with the website. It's, it, it stands to reason, and we acknowledge that. It is not an acceptable problem. It is one that we are working diligently to overcome. It is one that the President uh, is not happy about, uh, but it, it certainly makes uh, makes uh, it harder to, and has made it harder through the first month anyway, for, for individuals who want to enroll online to enroll online. So what was already going to be a low figure will be lower. But if, if you have at least one insurance company already coming forward and saying we're slashing our expectations, not just for this month, but in general in half, 
Well, I haven't, I haven't seen that, so I, I don't know the time frame. And, and Why not consider extending the enrollment period by a little bit, just to give people a little bit more time, to, to give the law more time to, to get the required number of people to sign up, particularly those young people? Well, Kristen, what I would say is that we are still in the early part of a pretty significantly long open enrollment period, six months. Uh, we believe that the website will be functioning effectively for the vast majority of the American people by the end of this month. And if that's the case, that there will be time for uh, those who are enrolling in order to have insurance on January 1st uh, to do so. And we are going to work all out to make that happen, both uh, by making the improvements to the website, but also in the broader outreach and education campaign that we're engaged in to, so that folks out there know what their options are, know what's available to them, and know uh, by when they need to purchase insurance. Let me ask you something that Senator Max Baucus uh, asked Secretary Sebelius yesterday, which is, why not just take the website down and put it back up on December 1st? Why not allow the tech experts to do their work and to take away what has become sort of a political football? I mean, obviously, as you know, Republicans continue to lash on to every glitch and there seem to be more and more glitches. So why not take the website down? It was the judgment of the teams working on this that uh, it could be fixed in this manner where there are re uh, regularly scheduled uh, times when the site is worked on and uh, improvements are made. Uh, and that during this period, uh, while these improvements were being made, that the site, while not functioning to the standards we want it to function to is still functioning uh, in a way that allows for people to get information and people to uh, register and ultimately enroll in insurance plans. So, but it's not so functioning though, so that people can get even information, basic information, Jay. Well, I, I certainly don't disagree with that, but I would say that if it if sometimes it isn't, that means sometimes it is, and that during those times, individuals are able to get information and are able to uh, sign up and to enroll, and that's obviously the goal here. Uh, as, I mean, as I, I, your question, I think, contains within it the suggestion that if the website were down completely for a period of time, uh, Republicans would stop criticizing, and I, I probably, I think I doubt that, but. Well, yeah. Jay, you, you were asked, or, and I'm not making that point, but more so that with each new glitch, it provides more. Well, there's no the question, and, and I think uh, we have acknowledged forthrightly and directly that this is not functioning the way it should, and that's unacceptable. And the President is uh, the least happy about this among a lot of people who are unhappy about it. And uh, that's why we're dedicating the resources and the, and the brain power uh, to the problem that we are. And we, we, we're focused on, as I said the other day, on the end purpose here, the end goal, which is not can we win the day or the week in the back and forth over Obamacare. Uh, you know, a back and forth that has been going on for four or five years now. Uh, but can we deliver on the promise of affordable quality health insurance uh, to every American? And it's not, it's not a happy situation when you have a, a website like this uh, not functioning as effectively as it should. Uh, but it just, it just means that, you know, we have to be focused on fixing those problems so that the benefits can be provided to the American people. We can't uh, take our eye off that ball. And you were asked earlier this week when specifically uh, the enrollment numbers would come out next week. You said you didn't have that earlier this week. Do you know now, now that we're ending this Mid-November is still my understanding. I don't have a specific okay. date. Monday, Friday? I, I, don't, I don't have a specific date. Okay. Uh, John and Peter. Uh, two questions, Jay. First, uh, you've said a couple times uh, uh, that by the end of November you want to have the site functioning effectively for the vast majority mm -hmm. of Americans. Vast majority, 70 percent, 99.9 percent. I would refer you to CMS and their regular briefings on uh, on the status of the progress being made, and and uh, you know for that question. The point being, I think, as I said earlier, that uh, we probably will never uh, say that you know tomorrow there will be zero uh, problems on a website like this, there, there aren't zero problems on any website that I use, right? So that any of us use. So what our point is, is that it functions effectively for, you know, the people who need to use it and are using it. You know, the goal here is to meet those standards so that people can get the information they need, 
you know, input the information they need to input and enroll uh, in a way that uh, is satisfactory to them and allows them to enroll in these insurance markets because, uh, th again, as I was saying to Kristen, that's the goal here. Uh, and it's not to get the perfect website and it's not to get, uh, it's not to win the, the political battle because we are sort of back in that, in that scrum that we've been in for so long here. And, you know, I know that we're here because of uh, the problems with the website that this, you know, that, that we're responsible for, and we accept that. Um, but we're still we're still there, and in the end, this is still a, a discussion and a debate about: is it the right thing to do to reform our healthcare system in a way that builds on the private insurance markets that we have, uh, that but can provide access to affordable quality health insurance to millions of Americans who don't have it? And the president's belief which has animated him since he ran for president, is that the answer to that question is yes. That's what we debated when the law was being considered by Congress. Uh, that's what we have debated ever since, as Republicans have sought to repeal it. And I would just remind folks that, in the end, these discussions circle around the question of, should we have reform or not? Because the alternative is, again, coming from the critics, is to return to the the world before the Affordable Care Act. And that world uh, is not one that I think most Americans want to return to. If I can move from the P5 plus one to the 2014 D's <laughs> plus one yesterday, Michael Bennett from Colorado, uh -huh. plus one. Uh, how big of a problem is it for the president uh, in, in terms of the 2014 uh, elections in terms of trying to keep the Senate uh, if the Obamacare website isn't up and running, if the law isn't being implemented effectively? Look, I think that the problem uh, is that you know, is in the implementation of the Affordable Care Act in a way that provides the benefits that it promises to millions of Americans. That, that's the problem. Uh, and from that, obviously, flows a lot of potential problems. Uh, most importantly, that people who need coverage, who have a pre-existing condition, who are cancer survivors but don't have affordable care now, need that care. That's what we're focused on. And remember, every one of the Democrats who uh, voted for this and believed in it and fought for it and with the president defended it against the constant assault by Republicans and outside opponents, uh, continue to believe in it and believe it's the right thing to do. There's no, in, in yesterday's meeting or in any other meeting about this, the, the, the concerns that Democrats have about the rollout of the marketplaces are the same concerns that the president has, which is that the website's not functioning effectively. That's a problem. Uh, you know, that, that information isn't getting to the individuals who are getting notices in a way that makes clear to them that they have a lot of options and they may qualify for Medicaid, they may qualify for tax credits. That's a problem. You know, also a problem, as the President identified yesterday, is that there, there are a number of states in the Union, including in Texas, a very large state, where governors made the decision uh, essentially to uh, refuse, on behalf of their constituents, assistance to their constituents in the expansion of the Medicaid program. Millions and millions of Americans who would qualify for coverage under expanded Medicaid who are being denied that coverage because of the uh, ideological decisions made by some uh, in different states because of the decision by the Supreme Court that allowed them to make that. Now, we're working at, with governors across the country uh, about that decision-making process because in the end, as we've seen in Ohio and Arizona and other states, you know, not just Democrats, but Republicans are recognizing that this is the right thing to do for their constituents, that they have Ohioans and, and Floridians and others who uh, want and deserve the benefits that are afforded by the Affordable Care Act. So that's what we're focused on. What, what I said yesterday you know, when I, about politics versus policy is that you know, the President is focused on getting the policy right. He's not pleased with the, fa with the fact that an aspect of the implementation here of the marketplaces and the, the, the rollout has not gone well. And, and his energy is focused on uh, working to make uh, that website more effective for the American people. Uh, when it comes to the ongoing debate about health insurance reform versus the absence of reform, you know, I think that I know the President and I know the Democrats are going to be where they've been, which is they think it's the right thing to do. And Republicans who argue that it should be repealed and offer nothing in replace are arguing, don't forget, that 
the provision within the Affordable Care Act that makes it, uh, that forbids insurance companies to deny coverage if you have a pre-existing condition would be removed. That kids who now are able to get insurance on their parents, uh, under their parents' plans up through the age of 26 would lose that privilege. That the benefits given already to seniors for their prescription drug uh, bills would be removed. And that's, and you know, it's, it's interesting to hear Sometimes critics say, well, they like this provision, they like that provision, but, but anybody who knows anything about this knows that you can't, you can't make sure that folks with pre-existing conditions get coverage if you don't have the individual responsibility provision. Uh, the, the, the whole has to work. And you know, we're gonna keep fighting for what we believe is uh, you know, necessary, which is providing this affordable quality health insurance to millions of Americans. Yep. Back on Iran, um, you said a few minutes ago that uh, the U.S. and Israel share the same goal, uh, mm -hmm. preventing Iran from having a nuclear weapon, yet um, apparently there's a, a big difference brewing with Israel on this negotiating strategy right now. Netanyahu said today that uh, this evolving deal would be an historic mistake. Uh, to what extent are you concerned that uh, you've got a split with Israel <coughs> making here? Look, there is uh, no daylight between Israel and the United States, between the President and the Prime Minister, when it comes to the uh, objective of preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. Uh, and all options remain on the table to achieve this objective. We've made that clear all along. We now, because of the uh, effectiveness of the sanctions regime that this administration helped put in place and led the way in putting in place, uh, an opportunity to explore whether or not the leadership in Tehran is serious about living up to its international ob obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to the IAEA and to the United Nations Security Council. And it is absolutely the right approach, in our view, to test whether or not they're serious and to do that in a careful way uh, that would have as its first step uh, an agreement to, potentially, if there is an agreement, to uh, halt all uh, activity, uh, advancement rather, on Iran's nuclear program and to potentially roll it back and in exchange for that to allow for some temporary moderate relief, uh, but reversible relief. Uh, and then we would explore whether or not in a verifiable, transparent and meaningful way Iran was willing to uh, assure the international community that ha it has uh, forsaken its nuclear weapons program. And we believe, and the reason to do that is because we believe, as we've said all along, that, that the best way to ensure that Iran does not acquire a nuclear weapon is to do it diplomatically through Iran's agreement and, and, and in a way that is verifiable and, and transparent uh, because alternative means of addressing this program uh, are not as effective necessarily, certainly not for the longer term. You spoke uh, of buy, the idea of buying time. Um, What's to prevent Iran from playing for time during this phased-in process that uh, appears to be playing out here? Well, look, the, the, the point I made earlier is that the first step would address Iran's most advanced nuclear activities, increase transparency so Iran will not be able to use the cover of talks to advance its program, and thereby create time and space as we negotiate a comprehensive agreement. It would stop Iran uh, from making progress, from advancing its nuclear program for the first time in nearly a decade. Uh, but but the, your question's a good one because it goes to uh, the heart of verification here and uh, our insistence that we take steps uh, that are concrete and that actions are concrete and they're not just promises. Uh, so any step we took would have to be verifiable. Does the administration trust <coughs> Iran, does it trust the, the leadership on the other side of the table right now? We have uh, a long history of mistrust here and a reason uh, to be highly skeptical. We are pursuing U.S. national security interests when we engage in substantive and serious negotiations through the P5 plus one. We do it in a way that makes clear that any progress we make has to be verifiable and transparent. Uh, and uh, because our goal and our objective is to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. And, that, and, and there is unity within the P5 plus one on both the objective and, and the process that we're pursuing at this time. See. 
as a general principle, if the Congress were to send the President a measure that constrains the ability to provide the limited reversible relief that you were talking about, would he use his veto to protect the momentum in this process? Well, we're working with Congress and we consult with Congress, and the, we have requested a pause in new sanctions, uh, but it's not a decision to support or not support sanctions. I think that we have demonstrated our uh, ample willingness to ratchet up sanctions in order to put the kind of pressure on Iran that has led to this uh, point. Uh, so the willingness to pause while we explore this possibility is really a, a demonstration of support for the possibility of a peaceful negotiated resolution to this is issue rather than uh, a march to war or a, you know, resorting to the other ways that we might have to address this problem uh, if we can't reach a negotiated, uh, verified agreement. But, but if Congress is trying to stop the President's waiver authority, does that not <coughs> call into question the U.S.'s ability to deliver on an interim agreement that he's talking about? Well, again, we're negotiating and consulting with Congress over this uh, issue uh, and updating them on uh, what we're doing and what the P5 plus 1 is doing, and, and our belief is that it is in the interest of the United States to pursue the possibility here of achieving an agreement, uh, to do so in a way that ensures that any relief that might be attached to a first step that would uh, halt uh, advancement on the Iranian nuclear program and, pa and maybe roll back some of its uh, advances, uh, that, that whatever the, the relief attached to it is reversible, it's temporary, it's moderate, uh, and would hold in abeyance the opportunity for Congress uh, and the United States in general, as well as our allies and partners in this effort, uh, to uh, terminate any sanctions relief and to, in fact, ratchet up sanctions pressure if necessary at, at, an, at, at the opportune moment if that moment arises. Roger. And then Dan. Uh, the GDP numbers that were out today showed a, a huge buildup in inventories, which suggests a potential slowdown of the economy in the fourth quarter as they work off those inventories. How concerned is the President about a slowdown of the economy in the fourth quarter, and might he be addressing that in the economic speech in New Orleans tomorrow? Roger, I, I think I can, uh, I can trust that you, of all people, read the, uh, the blog post that we put out uh, uh, in the wake of the third quarter figure. Fourth quarter. Uh, look, I think we can say about the fourth quarter that uh, the first month of that fourth quarter included a shutdown, and uh, we fully expect, uh, as well as outside economists and analysts expect, for that shutdown, uh, in, you know, imposed upon the American people by House Republicans, uh, will have a negative impact on the economy and will have a negative impact on job creation. I don't think there's any question about it. We'll, I think you're going to hear from uh, the Office of Management and Budget later today about uh, an assessment that we've done on the costs of the shutdown, and uh, others have done assessments as well. Uh, so uh, in terms of the analyzing today's data, I would refer you to uh, the CEA and the blog post. Uh, I think that what is true is that the 2.8 percent growth represents, you know, solid growth, uh, the 10th straight quarter of economic growth, and an increase in growth uh, 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 each of the last four quarters. And it comes in over estimates, as I understand it, over consensus estimates. And that's good. And I think the private sector growth uh, embedded in that number is even more robust. The, and what it tells us is that, that this economy is poised to continue to grow and perhaps grow more rapidly and create more and better jobs, and that Washington needs to stop throwing up obstacles in the way of positive economic growth, doing things for ideological and political reasons that actually harm and reverse the progress that we've made. That's what happened in October. And I know because other stories arise and they're important and they, they need to be covered that the shutdown now seems like a long time ago, but, but the economic consequences of that foolish pursuit are with us today and will be with us for a long time. You know, people, there are people in America who do not have a job today 
because House Republicans chose to shut down the government over their opposition to the Affordable Care Act. Will he put up on the infrastructure in New Orleans tomorrow? Uh, I think you can expect that he will talk about uh, the need to build infrastructure as part of a broader effort to strengthen our economy for the long term and to uh, increase exports. Uh, you know, this is the President takes a comprehensive approach in, uh, to the economy uh, and the, the investments that he believes we need to make, the kinds of investments that have traditionally been supported by lawmakers of both parties. Infrastructure is a key part of that. I mean, the, the virtue of investment in infrastructure is that uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a double win because you get the immediate effect of building and the jobs created from that and the economic energy and activity created by that and then the, the long-term benefit of uh, to the economy of improved infrastructure, whether it's ports or airports or roads or highways or bridges. I mean, these, these, these kinds of, that's why when you get something that has all that benefit, <coughs> Uh, both uh, near term and long term, you tend to get bipartisan support. And we've, there has been bipartisan support for that kind of robust in infrastructure investment in the past. We believe, and the President has put forward, uh, that there are ways to uh, achieve bipartisan agreement for infrastructure investment, and we're going to keep pursuing that. Jay. Steve. Jay. Oh, and then Dan, I said you next. Sorry. Jay, uh, I want to ask about, get back to this question of. Uh, what Congress is proposing, a lot of members of Congress are proposing on this question of if you like your plan, you can keep it, period. The President's promise. Mary Landrieu's proposal, she calls it the keeping the promise bill. Mm -hmm. The promise she's talking about, of course, is the President's promise. Mm -hmm. What would be so bad about grandfathering in all of these plans that people have now that many of them clearly like are contacting their lawmakers and are very upset about? What would be so bad about uh, signing a bill like that in the world? Well, Steve, what I can tell you is that, as I mentioned earlier, we are concerned about those individuals and concerned about the need to get them all the information uh, that, that they should have to, so that they're aware of the options available to them and the fact that, again, more than half will uh, be able to purchase higher quality insurance coverage for uh, the same or lower cost, that you know, half will qualify for tax credits, that up to a million will qualify for enrollment in Medicaid. I think the broader question, and I don't, I don't know the specific legislation or the details of the specific legislation that you're referencing, is, you know, goes to if we say that every, every insurance plan that doesn't meet the Affordable Care Act standards can continue in perpetuity, you're essentially saying there's no, there are no standards to be met. And it is certainly the belief uh, of the uh, drafters of the law and of the President that one of the purposes here is to, is to set some minim, minimum standards for coverage uh, so that every American has some, who, who gets insurance coverage has some security and certainty about the benefits they're going to receive and that you don't have, which happens, I think, all too frequently for some individuals, the, you don't have the rude awakening that uh, when you get a bill and find out that the plan you have that you thought would cover your costs uh, upon further inspection does not. Well, and Samuel Andrews' bill has some things in it. It says uh, those people would, who are going to keep their grandfather plan would be told about it, the deficiencies. Mm -hmm. would be told that they don't have hospitalization, for example. They, they would be informed. Sure. Uh, and that they could keep it, uh, not necessarily for perpetuity, but as long as they keep paying their bills. What would be so wrong about, I, I, letting, I, them, Steve, about I, letting them keep the plan sure. that they like? Steve, all I can tell you is that there, the reason why there are minimum standards is so that all Americans have that certainty and have that uh, guarantee that of, of basic quality insurance coverage. We're concerned about the individuals and, and I'm sure uh, you know, we'll be discussing them both here and elsewhere uh, going forward. But I, we've seen again and again, I think in some of the uh, reporting, uh, that not everybody out there who's getting notices is getting the, all of the information they need to ensure that they know that they have uh, an enhanced array of options available to them. Uh, so we need to work on that. Uh, more broadly, if I could also mention that it, it was 
it was also the case that with some of these plans, the, there, was an there, there, there was an option for early renewal uh, that uh, insurance companies and the insured uh, could take advantage of. Uh, and uh, what, is, what is true, too, is that there is a, you know, there's, there's an opportunity here for uh, insurers to take advantage of the fact that there's going to be a, a, a huge influx of people uh, in the market now purchasing insurance, and there is, uh, is a desire to uh, make sure that those, every, all those individuals are getting the information about the new plans that are available. But, uh, you know, I, my, our focus right now is making sure that these individuals are, are aware of what their options are and, and uh, making sure that they avail themselves of their options so that they can discover that, in fact, in many cases, they're going to get better coverage for less. Would the president veto such proposals? I, it's going to be one on the House floor next week, Steve, Chairman Upton's proposal. You've loosely described a proposal that I haven't read and I'm not sure is on paper, so for me to issue a statement of administration of policy about it, I think would be uh, getting a little ahead of myself. Dan. Thanks. Um, so based on reports, this phased agreement could, I mean, we could have an announcement on this as early as Friday. Will the president be actually speaking with Prime Minister Netanyahu, who has described this thing as, a, as Pete mentioned, a mm -hmm. mistake of historic proportions to, to ask him to support at least the first you know, phase or other phases of the program? The President, as you know, speaks regularly with Prime Minister Netanyahu, and uh, I'm sure we'll be speaking to him uh, again uh, in the near future. I don't have a, a planned conversation to preview for you. Uh, this is an issue that the two discuss frequently, that our counterparts discuss frequently. Again, we have an, an immense uh, amount of cooperation uh, with the Israelis on security issues and, and on the, the, the challenge of Iran. And, and that continues, and it's uh, enormously valuable to both countries, in our view. So uh, that conversation will continue. And again, I think it's important to note that the goal here and the objective here is identical, which is to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. And we are, uh, we are where we are because of the uh, consensus that the President built around uh, the need to um, respond to Iran's refusal to meet its international obligations, the, the demonstration of the fact that Iran uh, was the problem, that Iran had uh, declined to come uh, into compliance, and uh, the result was the sanctions regime that has uh, exacted a price from Iran, and that's why they're uh, at the table now you know, in large part. So the policy thus far has uh, been effective, but it, it, we are where we are. And the purpose here is to get to a place where we can verifiably uh, and in a meaningful way and in a transparent way make sure that Iran is honoring its commitments and has forsaken its nuclear weapons program. We're exploring the potential, uh, and we're working uh, in close uh, consultation with our allies and partners, including Israel, on this issue, and we are uh, obviously working through the P5 plus one on it. April, Jay. last one. Okay. Jay, um, two questions. One, uh, President Obama is having a screening tonight on a movie about Nelson Mandela's life. Um, Nelson Mandela is an iconic figure that the President uh, has a close kindred uh, spirit with. Has this White House reached out to the Mandela family recently to update on his health condition? Um, have they talked to the family recently? I, I don't have any uh, presidential conversations to uh, read out to you. Obviously, uh, you know, we are in consultation uh, with some degree of frequency with the South African government because of the importance of the bilateral relationship. Uh, when it comes to Nelson Mandela's health, I would not comment beyond, you know, referring you to his family and to the South African government. And lastly, earlier in this briefing, um, someone in the front row talked about consequences. Um, is this White House ready to start talking about consequences after all the problems with the rollout after four years with this website, the ACU website? Could you be more specific? Against those who built the website. Mm -hmm. um, simply put, I mean, they put it out and it wasn't working. Well, the President is focused on uh, getting it right going forward and not uh, Monday morning quarterbacking. Right now, the, in the intensity of the effort has to be on making sure that the improvements are made to the website, 
uh, so that the marketplaces are functioning effectively for uh, the American people. The, it's important that the, the, you know, that the teams that helped build the architecture here are, you know, are in place working with some of the new tech experts that we brought in because obviously they know best, you know, what, uh, you know, the, the sort of in, inside, uh, the insides of the, of the website and the, and the Internet architecture. So, uh, you know, we're focused on fixing the problems, not, uh, not on Monday morning quarterbacking or, you know, singling out people for blame. Right now, we need to make, get this thing working, and that's what the president has insisted that the teams at HHS and CMS do. But this is such a historic, uh, historic piece. Even the vice president even said, made mention when he finally signed it into law, how much of a big deal it was historically. But then this is a key, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so, <laughs> so you know, so it, and, and, but this is such a key piece, a cornerstone of this administration, and for it to go out so big and so wrong. I mean, was there not a tongue lashing if there were not consequences of head rolling? As a rule, I don't read out internal meetings. Uh, I would simply say that the president, as he's told you, uh, has not been pleased with the way that the website has functioned. But he's focused on and made clear to his team that they should be focused on fixing the problems so that the American people get the benefits they deserve and they get them sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, I, as you mentioned, this is obviously uh, an important piece of legislation uh, that I'm sure will be looked at uh, for many years in the future. And, you know, we don't want to deprive historians of the opportunity to give a lot of analysis. So we'll, uh, for now, we'll just focus on fixing the problems. Is it about a immigration or a uh, The President and Senator McCain, thank, uh, thank you for the question. Yes, Senator McCain, uh, as I think he uh, announced, is uh, coming to the White House to meet with the President. Senator McCain and the President meet and speak uh, with some regularity, as you know. Uh, they tend to address a range of issues. Uh, there's no uh, specific topic today, as I understand it. I'm sure they'll talk uh, and touch on a number of subjects. Jay, can you do an end of reaction? There were 10 Republicans in the Senate who voted for cloture. Goes to the House now. How much uh, political capital is the President going to invest in pressuring the House to do something? Uh, the President believes it is absolutely the right thing to do to pass the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, and uh, we'll have a more, I'm sure, uh, formal uh, reaction to the Senate vote. Uh, if that, in fact, has happened while I've uh, been up at the podium, that is uh, good news. Um, and we commend the senators who voted yes. And we hope and insist that the House take up the legislation. To oppose this kind of legislation uh, is to uh, announce that you want to be left behind by history. The necessity of making sure that every American has equal rights is fundamental to our history and to who we are. And that's what this legislation represents. Uh, some of the objections that I've heard from members in the House are reminiscent of objections that opponents of other civil rights legislation put forward. And they were wrong then and they're wrong now. Uh, this is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do because we're all equal. Uh, and so the House should pass it. The Senate has. And we congratulate the Senate. Thank you all.